are some things in life that allow us to remain neutral. These are issues where one thing is no better and no worse than another. On a personal level, it could be countless things from choosing a flavor of ice cream to style of music. On a national level, a country may choose to remain neutral in a conflict between two other countries. But when that conflict engages that third country, neutrality is no longer an option. When something or someone engages us, it requires a response. We only fool ourselves if we avoid the situation because our lack of response is itself a response, a choice. Jesus happens to be the least neutral person in the history of the world. There have been tens of thousands of books written about Jesus worldwide with new books coming out every day. Not to mention the explosion of countless online articles and social media opinions every day. Jesus has said, he who is not with me is against me. In other words, remaining neutral to Jesus is really opposition to him. In a cosmic war, there are no spectators. There are only two camps. If you are not in Jesus' camp, you're in the camp of the enemy. There are no other options. Which camp are you in today? As we begin chapter 7 in John's Gospel, Jesus is purposely staying away from Judea because of the Jews. There seems to be a gap of about six months between the beginning of chapter 6 and chapter 7. During this time, Jesus has been carrying out his ministry in Galilee. In another six months, Jesus will be crucified. Now, it is just before the Feast of Tabernacles. This is a feast, a fall festival that took place sometime around the middle of October every year. It was one of three festivals that required all Jewish men to attend and celebrate in Jerusalem. This festival lasted for seven days with a closing ceremony on the eighth day. The Feast of Tabernacles commemorated the time when their ancestors had lived in tents as they wandered through the wilderness before they reached the Promised Land. Last week, we saw how many of uh, Jesus' disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Jesus asked the twelve if they also wanted to leave. And Peter spoke for all of them when he responded, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. This week, we will see several different groups who rejected Jesus. Even Jesus' own brothers are in the group at this point. Jesus' family is mentioned early in Mark's Gospel where it tells us that they thought he is out of his mind. And it appeared that they wanted to take him to take care of him because it didn't appear to him, them that he was taking care of himself with his busy schedule, with the crowds pressing in around him constantly. But here in John chapter 7, Jesus' younger brothers are with him in Galilee. And they wonder why he isn't getting ready to go to Jerusalem to celebrate this big harvest festival along with everyone else. His brothers still don't believe in him at this point. He's just their famous big brother. And remember that the large crowds that had been following Jesus have dwindled. We kind of get the picture here that Jesus' brothers are having some fun at his expense. And I imagine it when something like this. Hey, Jesus! Wink, wink. Grin, grin. A uh, Feast of Tabernacles is coming up. Everyone's headed to Judea, even your uh, 12 sidekicks. Why don't you go down to Judea too and do some miracles there? After all, no one gets famous by hiding in a corner, right? You have to show them what you can do. Some laughing. I wonder how many times 
Jesus had to put up with this kind of being laughed at from his brothers while they were growing up. What kind of home life did you have? Were you one of those children who was a little bit different? You didn't quite fit in for one reason or another? You were misunderstood, made fun of? Remember that you have a Savior and a friend in Jesus who understands what that's like, and he cares about you. You can see the unbelief of Jesus' brothers and their mistaken idea that Jesus just wanted to be famous. He entered this, he, Jesus did not enter this world to become a celebrity. He came to be Savior. Jesus tells them, no, you guys go on without me. It isn't time for me to go. He's waiting on the Father's time. Well, Jesus leaves in secret, leaves for Jerusalem in secret after his brothers had gone. And that brings us to the next group, uh, which John labels the crowds. John is referring to the ordinary people, the masses. When John refers to the Jews, he's talking about the religious establishment, the leaders and the teachers of Israel. These terms are mixed in our text. So we get the picture that all of them are kind of mixed and mingling in and around the temple during this festival. And while the Jews wanted to know where Jesus was, the crowds were trying to figure out who Jesus was. Some said, he's a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. And while some continued to reject Jesus, we're told later, Verse 31, many in the crowd put their faith in him. So halfway through the festival, Jesus showed up in the temple courts and he began teaching. That's when John tells us about the response of the Jews. They're amazed. How did this man get such learning without having studied, they said. Today we'd say that he didn't have a university degree. He didn't have theological, formal theological training. So how come he knows the Bible so well? Other times people commented that Jesus spoke with authority. They noticed that he didn't constantly refer to Rabbi so-and-so, like the Pharisees did. He spoke on his own authority. He said, I say to you, I tell you the truth. The Jews wonder, who does this guy think he is? The Jewish leaders wanted Jesus dead. And Jesus knew it. Back in chapter 5, Jesus had healed a man on the Sabbath. The Jewish leaders decided that that was the last straw. He was undermining their authority as teachers of the law, and he had to go. Never mind that that... Uh, that killing someone is against the fifth commandment. It seems that Sabbath law was more important than murder. And that's in fact what Jesus accuses them of. He points out their inconsistency. They happily, happily perform circumcisions on the Sabbath if the eighth day is a Sabbath. But then they get upset when Jesus makes someone well on the Sabbath. Circumcision was a sign that their relationship with God had been healed. They'd been made whole. So Jesus healing the crippled man is the same sort of thing. Making something or someone whole which had been broken. Why couldn't they see it? He says because they judge by appearances rather than with right judgment. Just like his brothers and many in the crowd, they were judging Jesus based on their own human reasoning or emotions or the opinions of others. Just because something doesn't make sense to our tiny human brains or just because others say different, doesn't mean it's not true. 
And yet there is something about Jesus that does add up, that does make sense when you listen to him speak. And that leads to one more group beyond our text that I'd like to mention. The temple guards are sent to arrest Jesus. And they end up fighting him. But they decide not to arrest him. Why not? Because they're wondering if he might actually be the Messiah after all. There's something about him that rings true. Never has anyone spoken like this, they say. Over the past six chapters, John has been putting Jesus in front of us. Like the people in Jesus' day, we are called on to respond. Is Jesus who John says he is, who Jesus himself claims to be, is Jesus, God the Son, in the flesh, who left heaven to come to earth to be our Savior? Or is Jesus something less? I think it's easy for all of us to fall into the dangerous trap of judging Jesus based on our own limited and often faulty reasoning, or our fickle emotions, or based on the opinions of others. The fact is, that Jesus is not who we think he is or who we want him to be. He is who he is. He is God, creator, redeemer. He is everything the Bible says he is. The only way to see him rightly is through God's word with the help of of the Holy Spirit. I think most of you who are listening to this message or watching this video or even reading it for those of you who receive a printed copy, most of you have responded to Jesus in faith. Now, of course, this isn't because you're so smart. No offense. Smarter than all the dunderheads out there who don't believe in Jesus. It's not because you are better than all the rotten, rebellious people who don't believe. The work of believing is the work not of our own, but the work of the Holy Spirit. By nature, we are no smarter spiritually. We are no better than anyone else. We can't take credit for any part of our salvation, including the believing in Jesus part. It also means that we need to guard against forming opinions of Jesus apart from or outside of God's Word. We dare not ever trust our own ideas, our dreams, our emotions, our gut instincts, or other people's opinions, or we just might end up making ourselves miserable here and even worse for eternity. Praise God that you know who Jesus is and trust in him for who he is. Now, if you happen to be someone who hasn't yet made up your mind about Jesus, what are you waiting for? What about the people in your home? Each one needs to believe for him or herself. I'll say this with Mother's Day in mind. There's nothing more important than leading your children to know and trust in Jesus as Savior. And the only way that happens is for them to hear God's Word regularly so that the Holy Spirit can work saving faith in their hearts. It is not enough simply to get them wet as infants in baptism. Now, of course, there's so much more to baptism than just water. But faith is a living thing. The seed of faith planted in baptism can die if it's not watered and nourished regularly with God's Word. 
Don't make the mistake of thinking that you or anyone else can remain safely neutral toward Jesus. If you are not in Jesus' camp, you are in the enemy's camp. Jesus calls for a response. It reminds me of Joshua's words to Israel in the Old Testament when he said, If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. May you respond and say like Israel did, We too will serve the Lord because He is our God. Let's pray. Jesus, make clear to us precisely who you are as we stand face to face with you in John's Gospel. May that be especially true for the person who has not yet believed in you as Savior. Let your powerful word make its way through the ears to the mind and finally to the heart where the Holy Spirit will create saving faith. Where you have already created saving faith, guard that faith from any ideas, emotions, or opinions of our own or others that are contrary to the truth of your word so that we don't lose what we have in you. Lord, lead us to know you better by spending more time in your word. Your word beckons us to yourself. Just as your brothers and Nicodemus, a Pharisee among others, came to believe in you eventually, so your word goes out to call a world to believe in you. Make us bold as your disciples to not let people remain comfortably distant from you. Bless the ministry of this congregation and every other Christian ministry and mission all over the world as we proclaim your powerful and transforming word. On this Mother's Day weekend, we thank you for the blessing of moms. We have all been blessed with having a mom, and some have enjoyed the blessing of being a mom. Let every mom and every dad in every home know you as Savior, and make sure that everyone in their home knows you for who you are. This prayer is especially for those, even some whose names are connected with this congregation who might not listen to even a word of today's message or this prayer, who might count themselves as Christians but who have never taken the step of actually trusting in you as Savior and follow you. And it shows in how they live and raise their children. Your word says that you are near to all those who call on you, especially to those who are experiencing trouble. Be near us in whatever the circumstances may be. Those who are sick, those waiting for treatment, those who are unemployed, those who continue to serve others like those in the medical profession, fire and police departments, including those working in grocery stores and restaurants and gas stations, those who are anxious and afraid, young people who have missed out on so much, and others that we remember on our own. Continue to give wisdom to our leaders. We thank you for every blessing, even bringing blessing out of this current health crisis. We acknowledge you as our God and our Savior, and we rest in your unfailing love, protection, and provision, here and for eternity. Amen. Amen.